and welcome in everybody. This is the Orlando Drummer Podcast, episode 25, and I got a big announcement for you right off the bat. Uh, my signature snare, um, we've got a new batch that just released, the Entity OD. It is my personal favorite snare drum. Uh, hopefully that doesn't come as too big of a surprise, but uh, when we first launched this snare drum about six months ago, we only had what do we launch with? Maybe 25 snares. Uh, they were all gone within 36 hours. Uh, so we've got a new batch of 20 snares. Five of them are already gone at the time of this recording. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, I'll put a little bit uh, of the promo clip sort of in, in this podcast here. Uh, but there's a full video on YouTube, or you can head to EntityDrums.com. That video is also embedded on that page. You can learn more about it. It's a beautiful drum, and only 15 uh, of them are left. So yeah, go check that out. It's the Entity OD. Here's a little clip from the promo video. So this drum is 12 inches by five inches and it's made out of Jara, which is a native Australian hardwood. Now I know you're thinking just like I was that 12 inches is just too small to be a main snare. And normally I would agree with you, but when it comes to Jara, this specific wood is incredibly dense. Jara is significantly more dense than maple, birch, oak, ash, beech, or any of the other woods that you would commonly see used for a snare drum. And all of that density comes with a sound profile that is unlike any other wooden snare that I have ever heard. So Jara is a very sharp and a growly wood, and it has overtones that kind of replicate the sound profile of a metal snare drum in many ways. While Jara has tons of body, it's still very sensitive, it's extremely loud, and it's more than capable of cutting through the mix in almost any genre of music. While 12 inches is quite small, this reduced size helps to balance out a lot of the aggressive qualities of the wood. And for me, 12 by five is just the perfect size for this snare. So that's the Entity OD, exciting news. And how are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing wonderful. I'm uh, sporting a little chain here. Oh with, man, that uh, thing is fly. Oh, Look at so that cool. thing, dude. You can see that against <laughs> the back, black background there. It also comes on every Entity Drums signature snare. Yeah, so. and it's funny, you know, we've talked with him before on the podcast. You know Matt, actually. I do know Matt. Yeah, Matt's a um, super talented metal fabricator. Uh, he's such a weird, he's such a good example of like full-blown artistry, meets like utilitarian masculine job yep. right because he's like an artist mm -hmm. but also he's going to need to weld a whole bunch of stuff yeah. like like day to day right he's working with a lot of like heavy insane machinery and plasma cutters and it's so a cool, cool job so cool yeah love tools man. so yeah he made he made all we should clarify for anybody just listening on audio yeah. um he made all of the badges for the snare drum so they're hand hammered um really cool i went and filmed a little bit of him actually making them there but that's one of the the prototype badges we have but they're uh they're sick man really really cool he did an awesome job cool cool so yeah <laughs> go grab you an entity od oh, yeah. and uh what else we got going on today brother oh we usually start off every single podcast with a loop of the week oh yeah uh and i went a little bit not old school i feel like uh, so every October we have what we call Looptober, where we do uh, loop specials on the site uh, and give people, you know, bundles and get some deals to get sure. you some loops. But one of the most popular loop packs that I've seen, I get many emails about it all the time, is the Ambient. Uh, Ambient, yeah, loop pack. yeah, yeah. And so I went with that. Um, it's a very reliable loop pack, very very fun one to practice drums to. And the loop is slow burn. Slow burn. Yep, so 70 BPM loop for people Classic. to practice to. Yeah, Pretty yeah, cool. yeah. That's a weird one that I know like super well. I've used that in like a dozen videos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's three piano chords, dude. They hit hard. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really cool one for sure. And I didn't realize that was part of the ambient pack. Yep. Yeah, the ambient pack was when we circled back and took all of the early ambient loops that we had written and then bundled them together mm -hmm. uh, in that pack. That is a really, really cool pack. So yeah, check it out. Here's Slow Burn. I like 70 BPM. I, I like that tempo a lot. Just just slow enough to do 30 second notes, but 
not like painfully slow. It's it's a cool cool tempo to work a lot of stuff mm-hmm. out. That's a good loop, man. Good choice. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, like to showcase what we have to the people. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. So end loop of the week because I don't have much to talk about loops as far as I like playing to them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you but, go. But <laughs> uh, move on to the first segment of the podcast today right. player puzzle player puzzle uh, miss this one i haven't done this in a bit yeah so with so many drummers out there it's hard to tell the difference right so some stand out so well they're very recognizable and in player puzzle we'll provide three hints to see if adam can guess who's playing let's see if we can stump him all right so first audio clip is called magic magic go ahead and give that a listen audio clue number one That is the most, it sounds almost programmed. It's so slow and precise. Like what, definitely some weird subdivision stuff, right? Like felt like, like, uh, like quintuplet double kick kind of thing, man. But the independence level is so high. It almost made me think of like Daphne's Prado. He's one of those super, he's not a metal guy, but like that freakish octopus independence. Mm. I really don't know off of that because I'm going through metal players. Obviously it was like very metally. But I can't think of anybody off the top of my head who fits that kind of playing profile. That was really weird. Very high level, strange. Okay. Strange playing. All right, well, how about a hint for you? All right, what we got? All right, well, so this drummer set the record at Summer Nam of 2005 for the most single strokes in 60 seconds with 1,247 single strokes. That's about 21 strokes per second. (laughs) Of course it is. Man. Well, okay, so I wish I knew this guy's name. He's like a weird, I don't think you would pick this guy. It's a weird one. There was a guy named Donnie something who won Guitar Center Drum Off a long time ago, like 05 or something. And he definitely was a high-level metal metal player who did some of those single-stroke speed competitions. Mm. But I don't think it's that guy. I also don't think he's exclusively like that metal. So definitely high-level metal player, probably famous. But I don't know, man. It's into like sport drumming when you get into like single-stroke speeds like that. Yeah. Huh. That's really hard. All right. We got one more one more clue, I guess, right? Yeah. Well here, before before the clue. Okay. What do you think you could do in sixty seconds? In well, 60, how many how ooh. many single strokes could you play in sixty seconds? Single strokes. I, I don't know. I mean fully warmed up on like my best day sort of thing. I would hope I would hope I'd be in like the nine hundreds. Right. It's pretty high. Well, given that like, if the fastest in the world would be twelve hundred and change. I don't think I would be able to come close, but I also, I think it would be, speed is one of my stronger suits, right? Not that I'm Mm -hmm. like anywhere near the fastest drummers in the world. I don't think I would be in the 1100s, for example. I'm not even sure I could break a thousand, but I also know that it, that I'm relatively quick compared to a lot of drummers. It's just not something I had to work. I don't want to say it that way. It, um, speed comes naturally to me. It's like one of my stronger skill sets. Okay. But I don't practice for endurance either. So, like, who knows what happens at the 30-second mark where it's like, bro, you're halfway done. And I'm just like, ah, that's a lot of single strokes. <laughs> I'm running out of single strokes here. I don't know. I would, I would hope 900, somewhere around there. You so, know? At, at Winter Nam 2022, whenever you go, because it's been a few years, mm-hmm. and maybe it's time to go. <laughs> if, gonna they have, the single if they have a the competition... competition you should do it, and then we'll <laughs> really like, see. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I do think it's in that sport drumming category where, like, you can you can practice just that and get really good at just that. You could. You could. 
Yeah, I don't, I've, I've they, seen, you've seen those YouTube videos of the competitions. Yeah, it's weird, it's, right? Yeah, they do mash grip and traditional grip. So mm -hmm. there's two different classes to it. And yeah. I think this record was with traditional grip. With traditional grip, so strange. I don't. I feel like I'm. I've got to know who this guy is. Mm, but you should should I think every drummer should know who this guy is? Okay. All right. So we do. We have one more hint. Yeah, one more hint. in a little photo. Oh, it's in the photo here. Um, the photo named Magic. Magic. Oh, it's his kit set up. Okay. Mm. Let's see. Oh, one of those freakish symmetry people. Mm -hmm. Super symmetrical. Oh. Okay. Oh I, man. Oh man. <laughs> I okay. I I have a guess, but I'm like, I feel bad because if this is the if I'm if I'm right and it is this drummer. I grossly underestimated his playing because the skill level of that first clip was like, I don't know, that was more abstract than anything I've heard this guy play. But I do have a guess, and I know I'm in the ballpark, Oof. but I'm not sure if this is the guy, so I'm going to go for it. Um, fellow Floridian, snake collector... Brother Derek Roddy. No. No, not Derek Roddy. <laughs> I knew you I were going to say Derek for some reason. Um, but no, it is not Derek Roddy. Not Derek Roddy. Okay. It is Mike Mangini. Mike Mangini. Yep. Should have known. We put him in the podcast last time for Swap Steady Shed. Yep. 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 Yeah. Man, I didn't know he... The, God, I've never heard anything that crazy from him is that clip that you played that, that was, was outrageous from, like a steve vi tour he did it back in 2001 or two yeah um where he like was soloing and then in the middle of the solo uh he's like wiping sweat off of his forehead with like the rhythm magazine where he's on the cover wow or, like that's where a weird he's one. like the the weird move um you know the main article in the, in the magazine just out of pure fame but, <laughs> yeah mike is insane man see I, I would have put him in a little bit more closer to like Derek Roddy like more of a traditional metal player mm -hmm. that was vi that clip was super abstract man that was awesome is there a video that matches that clip yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah you can look that up it's just like Mike Mangini solo on YouTube sick um, yeah I want to see that man ago. that was some uh like Garska level double kick freedom kind of thing yeah, yeah. he's got a, such fast hands he will just like straight eighth notes with the left and then like 30 seconds on sure, his right. Sure, sure. It's just wildly yeah, ambidextrous blasting, all that yeah. wild stuff. That was a good one, man. Crazy, you got, you got crazy, me for man. sure. Yes. For sure. All right. Wow. First win for a while. <laughs> a little while. Haven't won in a while. All right. Well, I uh, hope I get this next one. Okay. So this next one, uh, the audio clip. In the files tab there is called Mixed Breed, so go ahead and click on that. Mixed Breed, here yeah. we go. I have a guess, uh, based off of the sporadic nature of that, like mm. that weird, like fluttery power, you know? Weird one, though, because uh, like a touch of vintage influence, like this guy's slightly older, but still really modern. Also, definitely famous because he's playing a drum solo in front of a large crowd of people. So it would be a known name, that's for sure. I don't know, man. It I, Okay, I, I do have one guess, but I'm nowhere near confident enough to actually 
say that guy's name. Mm. RB would be the initials for anybody playing at home. Maybe, maybe. What else we got on this particular wild drummer? Well, this wild drummer's associated acts include Snoop Dogg, Erica Badu, Celine Dion, Justin Timberlake, P. Diddy, Timbaland. Ah, mm. see, the problem is some of those people, like Justin Timberlake has had like five different famous drummers before. I'm sure it's Celine Dion has two, so... But this guy could could have played all of those. That's a tricky one. Mm, okay, I still can't guess this guy just yet. Mm. Just yet. What else? We got a kit photo? Yeah, we do have a kit photo from okay. this, this drummer. Oh, okay. So this changes my guess, but I'm still... Okay, I'll tell you who my first guess was. That I'm going... Let's find mm. out if these are Minels. We got a Thomas set up. 12-inch rack tom, and then a weird little, is that like a snom for the snom, snom something like that? Oh, but so. Earthworks, too. That helps. Earthworks mics. I think these are minor symbols. Can't quite tell, but that stack hole cutout pattern looks minor. So it's like minor tama. Um, yeah, I see a dual crash in the back. Yeah, so yeah. definitely minor. So my first guess Purely based off of this sporadic, powerful playing was was Ronald Bruner Jr. Because he has that style of that like explosive kind of sporadic power. Um, but now seeing this kit, that Tom set up, makes me want to say uh, Robert Sput Seawright. It is. Hey. Sput. Sputty. Sput. Dude, he's a... He's a crazy talented guy, and drums are just like a portion of what he does. Yeah. Um, he, he's a crazy, crazy arranger, like yeah. composer, producer, very musically fluent, well outside yeah. of drum world. Yeah. Um, I've met him a handful of times. The most time I feel like I ever spent with him was at um, uh, VF Jams. Oh, the yeah, first year yeah. that they did that, yeah. they invited a bunch of us there, and it was like half a snarky puppy. Uh, was in that band. Well, it was Ghost Note and then a bunch of other like guest musicians yeah. that were in there as well. Um, and he ran that show, um, did all of the... He was like musical director for that entire project. But yeah, man, super talented guy. Super cool too. Really, really good guy to um, to just have a conversation with. Very friendly, very... Just a kind dude, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was awesome. And cool playing from him. That was pretty, yeah. pretty energetic for him, I think. Yeah, most of like his playing that's on the internet is accompanied by music so it's actually mm -hmm. difficult to find a solo clip a solo clip because there's even clips where it's just like he's accompanied by another percussionist and, yeah yeah, uh, yeah from like ghost note or something like that yep. and so yeah it was it, i mean it's a beautiful playing yeah I, I i wish i could have an ounce of that skill yeah it's man so cool. he's so musical too like like very yeah. it, it is abstract but it's still very tasteful you know as as far as he pushes like rhythmic boundaries it's still listenable in a way mm -hmm. um which you know and it's not to like knock him but like a drummer like mason gidry who we've you know talked about on this podcast before yeah. it's so abstract that if i showed this to mom or girlfriend or wife or yeah. guitarist friend they might just be like what yeah like it's yeah, really it it's annoying. really fast but like well i don't know what's going on <laughs> like it's yeah. hard you know you really got to be a drum nerd to fully appreciate people like that um but with Spud, it's not quite like that. It's still high level, but also very listenable, very musical. So yeah. that's a cool one. Awesome, mm -hmm. man. Those are uh, those are good ones today. Sweet. Cool. Well, that would do it. Play your puzzle. Got a point today. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that is on the board. If somebody wants to tally that mm. up and say how much. Because I don't know. After you got at least episodes, three or four, right? We got to go back and like watch it so we can update the score. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know where I'm at. You're winning, clearly. But um, it's hard. It's hard to stump you. <laughs> it really is. I hope so. I've been doing yeah. this a little while. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll pick some off uh, off brand drummers next time. There you go. Get you. So that'll do it for Player Puzzle. That'll move us on into Accent or Ghost. Accent or Ghost. All right. A fun one. So this is a piece where we get Adam's view on many aspects of the drumming industry, and we'll get uh, an approval, which is an accent or a disapproval, which is a ghost. So what do you think about going fully electronic from day one as a drummer? Mm, I would say no for most people. No, that, that's probably not the way to do it. I think the biggest problem that you'll run into is, uh, well, you run into several problems, if I'm being honest. The, the first of which is that there's only so many things you can do with an electronic hit, and for the most part, gigging is not one of them. Like, 
if you were, okay, let me start, start it this way. If you were going to do that, I think it makes sense that you you should be the kind of person who's exclusively interested in like programming and recording drums. Because if that was all you ever wanted to do was like write drum parts in a studio for maybe for someone else to eventually come record or maybe just for you to have, um, what's the word, like scratch tracks for your band. So it's like you're the producer of the band and maybe you play guitar, but you would really like to be able to write and record some drum parts for that project and have them sound uh, you know, relatively good so you could record over them. And eventually you'll take that to a studio, maybe you hire a drummer or maybe you have a full-time drummer in the band. You know, So you get that electronic kit for the purpose of writing and recording. To me, that's fine because that's that's the whole point, right? But if you ever see yourself being the actual drummer doing the recording in the studio, you're not going to be able to use an electronic kit. Um, if you ever wanted to, to play gigs and go on a tour, pretty uncommon that you would exclusively be on an electronic kit. Um, and, and then I think you're gonna you're gonna run into problems where you'll find that switching is not so easy. It, it's not very easy to have the same degree of comfort on an acoustic kit as you have on an electric kit, unless you switch really often and kind of go back and forth. The rebound is different. Um, the the like density of the thing that you're hitting is different, right? It has different different feels to it. And I have mm. heard of people that have had to make har- hard transitions from acoustic kit playing to electronic kit playing, and they have wrist problems because you don't realize all of these little little things that you do somewhat differently when the rebound sort of changes. So th- there's definitely a learning curve there. I think the best way to do it is to switch, is to switch mm. often, you know, frequently jump back and forth between um, the electric kit and the acoustic kit. So you have a degree of comfort on both for sure. But I think, yeah, the only people that should be doing full-time electric kit and nothing else are, yeah, man, people in a studio. It's just writing and recording and producing drum parts. Mm. That would be your main tool for the job. Um, if there's a sound limitation, like you can't be loud all the time, or you just right. want to like MIDI these drums right into a program and then start to mess with them. That makes a lot of sense to me. So I think it's like 90% of people that's going to be a ghost, but the 10% left over, they get the accent. If it's a writing tool, that makes the most sense. All right. Okay. It's a fair answer. So it's going to get a ghost? Yeah, mo- get mostly, mostly a ghost. Because you get asked this from young, younger drummers who are like, hey, I'm just now getting into drum world. I want to start, I want to be a drummer. And I'll, I want to go buy an electric kit. I normally don't lo- love that. I don't love that. I think you're you're giving up a cool factor for sure, um, and I hate that you could you could play and practice drums for like two years on an electric kit, and then you go over to your buddy's house to jam, and he's like, "I got an acoustic," and you're like, "Ah, this is weird. I like it shouldn't be weird, it. right?" Yeah, I mean, you, for your first child, you wouldn't get an electric kit. I would day one. No day one, full acoustic. Here you go, full volume. I mean, you got a studio, but. Yeah, you yeah. Think like, you know, might... I don't want you like going in there. Da, 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 like, you stay inside, stay in the house. Like, man, they just want to do that, and it's loud. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've had electric kits before. To be honest, if I if I have a true choice, I can play the acoustic or the electric. I never pick the electric. No, um, no. I just never pick it. I don't know why. It's always just like not quite what I want to do right now. <laughs> but that seems to be the case every time. Uh, I, I never pick it. So, I don't know. I think. I think it should be, I'm so glad it's an option. You know, I've been to the Roland headquarters and seen seen the stuff that they had. Like, mm-hmm. it's not just Roland, obviously. There's Yamaha and Alesis and many other brands. Um, I'm so glad that that world exists. I think it's awesome. Mm-hmm. But I really don't know in my mind if it could serve as like a true replacement for real drums. No, not, no. Yeah, not, even not on as an a individual true replacement. basis. I, no. If someone said, like, I don't really, I'm not into acoustic drums, I like electric drums, I'm like, mm. Drums are so old. Weirdo. They're so many thousands and thousands of years old yeah. that, like, oh, I don't know, like, you don't want to feel the actual energy come off the drum and move through your body because that's what happens when you play a drum. Mm-hmm. And that's a really old, like, like you could use the word like sacred human experience. That's a really, really old thing that humans have been doing for a super long time. And so to say like, oh, I'm not really into that. Like I like the like, <laughs> like a mesh pad with a dot on a computer screen. Like, ah, there's something missing there for me. Uh, but with all that said, I'm super glad they exist. It's, it's amazing technology. It'll blow your mind if you sit down on a Roland TD50, you know. They're yeah. just, they're freakish machines, man. They're so cool. They're super fun. All right, cool. Well, 
That gets the ghost. What do you think about only ever using single strokes in your playing? So never, <laughs> never, ever using double strokes or triple strokes or. So you're talking that anyway. Travis Barger style, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of sort of how yeah. he plays. Yeah. Yeah. I think single strokes tend to lack a certain finesse for most people. You you can finesse them and make them delicate and and quick with like certain textures you technically can do that but they're they're not they're not suited for everything so i think you run into you run into that issue right they have a very specific texture and that texture is normally a little more like on the aggressive side so you struggle for like really low controlled dynamics that's one thing that you would run into if you only played singles the other thing um is mobility mobility because you you Whatever note you play, it's a right hand on the floor tom. Well, the next note has to be a left hand. That's the rule. It's only single strokes. So if you wanted it to also be on the floor tom, but then you had a hi-hat, like, like you're going you're gonna to run into situations where you have to cross over, where you have to very quickly do a sweep. or, or Well, it's technically not a sweep. That will be doubles. But like you're going to have to move very quickly in awkward positions all the time. It's gonna happen frequently as you become more mobile and try to move those single strokes around. So one thing that doubles allow you to do is it buys you an extra note because if the pattern is right, left, left, the extra left that you added, it's not single stroke, so it's not right, left, right. It's right and then two left hands. That extra left hand buys you one note amount of time mm -hmm. to move the right hand to another place. So it gives you like little little intermissions in your playing in which you can move your hand somewhere else more conveniently because I got I got extra time, right? So that that's one of the, the big reasons that you you want a, a wide variety of rudiments to choose from because they each come with different advantages. And Buying your hands time is one of those advantages. If you can play doubles on one hand, it's just an extra note uh, that you can use that time to move your right hand around. Mm -hmm. Also, there are there are accent advantages inside of different rudiments. So for example, if you wanted to play, let, let's just say we don't know what the pattern is, but I want you to play six notes. And in those six notes, the first two notes have to be loud and the last four notes have to be very quiet. So you can use single strokes to do that. You can go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. You can do that. But think about the paradiddle diddle. It's it's fundamentally built to make that sound because mm -hmm. it's right, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, left. So certain rudiments are like catered to producing a sound. Single strokes are more like a, it's like the rice of the rudiment world. Like it's kind of like this underneath thing that works for everything. Does that make sense? The, <laughs> it's not the base to a Chipotle bowl. It's, exactly. It's not <laughs> it's not specialized, right? There's no spice on it oh, yet. Oh man. It's uh, it's not specialized for anything. It's so it's like that that baseline like template pattern, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Would you like white or brown? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, it's Yeah, uh, okay. Right? That it makes sense. Yeah, and maybe double strokes would be the brown rice. Like it's a little more something, but it's still, you double know. Double strokes are the beans. Yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like that. That's a weird analogy. And then hertzes are the meat. Yeah. And then, yeah whatever. Chipotle lesson pack coming soon. Oh you know? man. We're just building, <laughs> building burrito bowls over here. Um But anyway, yeah. it, it, so to sum it up though, would you ghost or accent only ever using single strokes because it sounds like from a fundamental perspective you should accent them well but from any perspective beyond rice yeah. it should be ghosted yes okay i i mean i think i'm gonna give it the overall ghost because mm. there is a weird camp of people who, and they're young drummers normally young punk drummers who normally say this i've seen this comment a dozen times over the years where they say like, why would I learn rudiments when I could just play single strokes for everything? And what they don't yet understand is that it colors your playing. Your play, I can hear that the only thing you're playing is single mm. strokes, right? And you can't change that until you learn more rudiments. So it's one of those things. It, it's like a technically, yes, technically you can use single strokes for absolutely everything and it will be possible but it's it's so far from optimal optimal in the domain of mobility, uh, in the domain of dynamics, of texture, um, and even ease of playing. Like it's harder to play some things mm -hmm. with only single strokes, even though technically it's possible. 
Um, yeah, I, I would say I think the people that, that that are in that camp and make that argument, all oh, single strokes, bro. Uh, I, I think there's a lot that you're missing for sure. Yeah, weird to be in that camp. I don't know. Yeah. As soon as you discover double strokes, you're like, oh, there's so much more. Well, there's there's more, but there's it's potential. also double strokes are hard. They're really hard. So that's why I think it's why a lot of people like really put their foot down on singles. It's like, oh, the easy ones, huh? Like that's what you love. Like mm. I bet I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. But they, the, all that to say, there are styles that depend on on that sort of playing. Travis Barker's a good example. He plays a lot of stuff with really fast, powerful single strokes, and it sounds good. So, you know, can be done. Can be mm -hmm. done. Okay, cool. Well, usually we only have like two questions on Accent of Ghosts, but today I have a third. Okay. It's very, very interesting. With a video to accompany it. Okay. What do you think about cyborg drummers? Cyborg, like building a robot to play? No, drums? no, so think about the, from an anthropology, perspective a cyborg is any you know living organism that uses technology to aid in a task oh so we're all technically cyborgs correct yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. contact From lenses and spinal fusions and, cell yeah. phones smartphones sure they, sure, they, sure they all help right so um, let me i'm gonna send you a link here for this video okay got the link right here let's open this up It's sick. I mean, really cool. This guy also, he, he doesn't have a hand or an arm on that hand, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, Jason Barnes. Okay. Um, and Jason lost the lower half of his right arm in about 2012 uh, after, you know, he got in an accident. Uh, and then uh, he approached the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media. Uh, or so, sorry. Said, so build me an arm. Uh, well, he was actually enrolled there. Oh, uh, that makes more sense. Yeah, okay. and then uh, he was introduced to a couple of people at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and they hatched a plan to build Barnes a robotic arm that would allow him to play just as well as any human drummer. Wow. Or perhaps even better. Definitely better. <laughs> Definitely better. So what do you think about... Let's say we, we get into a territory where then we just start adding appendages onto humans, mm -hmm. and we have... True octopuses. Octopi? Octopi. Isn't there octopi? Octopi. Like octopi. Yeah. We have true octopi drummers playing with four limbs, six limbs. Just, yeah. You know, because what? this this appendage is, takes synapses from your brain. Yeah. And translates it into mechanical movement. Sure. So if we were to develop that technology, which we have sure. as human beings, even further... I think it it definitely gets well into the technic technological like ethics. Mm. Did I say technological? Technological. Technological, technological ethics. There's definitely something a little weird there because I you might run into the problem of like a drummer who physically can't play anything but like their mind is developed. So they do understand like rhythmic concepts and their brain can execute them, but their body cannot because they never learn how to do that because they have robot arms, right? Or they use a machine to do that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. this, would, this would not be too far off from someone who is very good at programming drums and they can write advanced drum parts. So mentally they have the capacity to, to understand high level rhythmic execution, but the execution part they can't do with their body. They have to use a machine or a computer to do that. And there's definitely some interesting ethical discussions to be had there. Uh, this guy, Jason Barnes was his name. Mm -hmm. I mean, he clearly gets a pass because he doesn't have an arm. Like, what do you want the guy to do? Like, of course he's going to use the crazy piece of technology to do it. So it, it's a little interesting in, in that case. I think the line gets crossed when you talk about people who, there's nothing wrong with you. You just don't want to practice do, doing this with your body. And you prefer to lean on the technology to execute this sort of thing. But that's a really muddy area because you also can't make an 808 sound without an, you know, an electronic drum to do that, right? Like, so, so there's a whole, we depend on technology for all sorts of musical expressions all the time. Um, my whole career is based off that. This podcast is based off of that. We have to use tech for our expression really often. But this is some weird territory. So 
I don't know. I don't know that I can accent or ghost this one specifically because it's so complicated. I mean, this guy gets the hardest accent. Mm -hmm. Like, bro, you got a robot arm and you can play drums again. That is super sick. But if there was someone who like had never practiced and they were like, I want to be drum, I want to be a drummer, but I'm gonna need to be a robot drummer because I'm not working this out with my wrists. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, well, really? Like, that's how you want to do it? It's a little strange, but. Uh, I will accent the technology because it's just fascinating, you know. Mm. Yeah, but right. it, where it gets weird too is, is it they will always beat humans. It's always better, so <laughs> right? There's no there's no argument. Like you aren't as good at, at doing anything as a computer could be potentially yeah. at least. It will all it better better at everything. So yeah, that's an interesting one for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see more of this in the future, of course. Well, this is oh, an old yeah. video too, right? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You can. 2014. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a little, little bit old. Weird though. I don't know why we haven't like talked about this before, but all right. Well, when I show up with an exoskeleton, yeah, uh, Elysium, <laughs> and just kill everybody, it'd be cool. By kill everybody, I mean kill everybody in the drums. Yeah, exactly. Literally murder people. <laughs> all right. Well, that'll do it for Accent or Ghost. Cool. Always a fun topic of conversation. Move on to Sleeper Spotlight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in this segment, we introduce a drummer, drummers, uh, that y'all are sleeping on. And we get Adam's opinions, impressions, and constructive criticism, if any. First up, we have Stevie underscore drums. That's Stevie Lomangino from New York. Okay. Stevie. Take a look at Stevie. Video number one from Stevie. was um super clean i like it that was a really articulate groove too it was very specific trying to sing out that left hand pattern yeah it was pretty pretty tricky yeah i like his set too he's got looks like a dw bop you know what that is mm -hmm. a pretty small dw i think my buddy uh devin sumner who was just in town um killer drummer by the way he, did, he wasn't able to do this podcast but he did an episode of all in with Adam, but drummer, long, long time friend. Um, he's got a DW Bop kit. He loves that thing. Mm -hmm. Really cool sounding kit. And then an AQ2 sonar snare. That snare sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, not tuned for jazz particularly, but I also like I liked that sound that he had yeah. going on. Real like um, pop hip hop sort of thing, that higher mid range. Yeah. Really clean playing, man, for sure. And that audio quality too is beautiful. Yeah, yeah it was mixed. Studio quality. Mixed very well. Yeah. Awesome. That was a cool clip from him. He didn't do to his credit he was trying to play a very consistent particular groove the entire mm -hmm. time which he did an awesome job um, of doing but what not a lot of like fills or improvisation or things like that so let's see what else stevie has going on all right in clip two Cool. That was awesome. Very short and sweet, but definitely the exactly what I was just talking about. Like, I'd love to see more. Like, that's what I want to see. <laughs> the uh, the you're good at picking these clips for yeah. sure. You'll pick the the groove oriented ones, and then a little more yeah um, impromptu. You know that sort of stuff. That was cool, man. Very very. I like. I, I, you guys have always heard me talk about this, but I love the exploratory quality that people can have in their playing, where they're willing to. Just speak freely on the drums. And I want to give you a, here's a quick example of like why I like this. Have you ever met someone who the way that they talk seems very rehearsed? I'll tell you where you see this all the time. The corporate world. Yeah. Like a, the corporate boss comes in and they're just like, hey, here's what we're doing today. And it's like, you're a robot. Like I'm not, we're yeah. not you're not talking how a normal person mm -hmm. talks. We're saying like the corporate vernacular, like it, there's only, you're only allowed to be so human. And then you interact with like, a normal person somewhere <laughs> and it's like it can be very different where it's yeah. like oh you act like a real person mm -hmm. and a lot of that is like letting letting the guard down so to speak like like speaking and expressing yourself freely and openly and so i like when people have a have the ability or at the very least the willingness to do that on the drum set like let me hear exactly what you have to say i know you can learn drum parts like i know you can play this famous groove or this famous fill mm -hmm. But that's not super interesting, right? Like the, to me, that that's 
that's not uh, that's not what makes you an interesting drummer. What makes you an inter- interesting drummer is how your how your brain like expresses rhythm. And so I love when people uh, not only play like those those tight rehearsed grooves like he played in the first clip, but when they do this, like I love I love seeing this sort of stuff too. Like let me hear your voice. What do you have to say? So mm-hmm. that was cool, man. Really clean, articulate playing for sure. Um, and exploratory. You can tell he was trying some sort of weird stuff. Those like snare crash and then crash snare on like 16th notes, like real real quick sort of thing. He had weird snare buzzes in the beginning of the clip. Um, that was a really cool clip, man. Very, very expressive, exploratory kind of playing. And I, I really like that quality. So um, that was cool. Yeah. You picked some good clips too. The tight groove and yep. then this sort of thing. I yep. like that. that I, well, awesome. I like, I only pick these drummers that have this sort of variability in their playing. A lot of the times when you go through posts and Instagrams and, and social media pages of drummers and you realize that they really only have like one shtick to them. It's common. And very so, common. Yeah. That, that, um, it's just being very plain and being very, yeah. uh, very predictable in your playing and that sort of thing. I don't know, it turns me off from drummers. Sure. And I don't necessarily want to highlight people who are just the same groove or the same type of playing sure. all the time. Even if it's high level. Even if it's good. Even yeah, if it's arg- good. arguably, it's just like, all right, cool. Well, and this applies to even content styles. Like when people do, let's say, oh, it's only drum covers. That's it. Only covers. To me, it's sort of like this... Yeah. And people people don't like hearing this, but like yeah. that is a that's a dead end road. Like, yeah. are you going to do covers forever, forever and then die? Is that is that the plan? Because it to me, that's like a forfeiture of musical individuality. Like, that's not who you are yeah. as a drummer. It can't be. It can't. Well, be. I can't imagine. I can't imagine like going up to like a band and you're just like I'd like to be your drummer and it's like what can you do? And it's like well I can. I, I can play over Katy Perry songs. Sure. And it's like, sure. that's cool, but we have original music. Can you learn these parts for it? Can you bring your own yeah. flavor to this? Yeah. 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 Oh, you can just kind of do the same licks over this. No, yeah. we don't. It's just not. Well, it's I don't like. I know, man. Like, I don't know. Well, the most beautiful part about music, I hope everybody would agree with this. It's it's mm. expression, right? It's getting yeah. to getting to express your, yourself in a really unique, artistic, creative way. And if your favorite or rather the exclusive type of expression that you like to do is just what other people expressed. You just like to mimic that in some way, mm-hmm. right? Like, uh, to me, you're, it's like you're missing so much of what it is to be a musician, right? That the, the true expressive creative core of what musicianship is. Um, all that said, I do think like learning covers, sorry, getting sidetracked on cover, but like I do think that is a really important part of the learning process. Right. But it, I hate when I see 10 or 15 or 20 year drummers who only do drum covers because I'm like, dude, you you should be out of this phase at this point. Yeah. Not that you can't do them at all, but like that can't be your primary interest in playing drums is just to learn and recreate what other people have already done. Anyway, we're getting off track. Stevie, you're awesome. That was uh, Thank those were you, good Stevie. clips. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Give Stevie a follow. Stevie underscore drums on Instagram. He's dope. He makes some awesome content. Hell yeah. And thank you. And next up uh, was uh, someone submitted this drummer to me via email. Okay. By the way, if you have any drummers that you'd like featured on the podcast, you can send me an email at chris at orlandodrummer.com. Yeah. Which this was. And this is. Emmy Cooey Drums. Emmy Cooey. Uh, he's a teacher and session player from Romania. Okay. It's very, very cool. So we got a couple of clips from, uh, and I'm probably butchering this, Emmy Cooey. Emmy Cooey, yeah, all right. That's what it is. Clip one from Emmy. Three, four. There you go. Those her to threes, man. Mm. Very, very snappy her to threes for sure. Yeah. I also love hearing really intentional dynamics on a practice pad. I think a lot of people, not not that people like don't don't use dynamics on a practice pad, but it's normally not that extreme because a drum set is a mo- much more dynamic instrument, right? So it's like dynamic practice is a lot easier on a full kit. But you can certainly hear him intentionally moving that volume really, really high up where he's just like 
absolutely like whacking the pad with those huge drumsticks. Um, and then you can hear those softer touches, like when he gets into the six stroke roll, the second half of that exercise, uh, he quiets things down a lot. So yeah, very cool, very drum teacher thing to play. That's yeah. that's for sure. But those hertas are, are very quick, very clean. And um, yeah, again, I lo- love the the dynamic movement in that. It's not not always common that you see people swell their dynamics that much on a practice pad. More of a teacher thing for sure. So I can yeah. see that. Very cool, man. That was awesome. Yeah. Let's do another clip from him. Let's see. Clip two. Clean and powerful, that's for sure. He did a lot of mannerisms that I, that I love to play. like, um, But he did it with a double bass. Let me see if I can figure out what he was doing. So a pattern like, okay, six note pattern. Right, left, right, left, left, kick. So But then you stutter. I have a whole master class on this concept of kick stuttering. You stutter the kick drum. So and so it doubles in subdivision and you play two notes where there was just one. So it's So right, left, right, left, left, kick, kick, right, left, right, left, left, kick, kick. So you stutter that kick drum and double it up. But he did it where he it was like three. Where it was like duka duka ga duka 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 ga kick 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 duka duka right? He could he be stuttering the right foot and then adding in a third on the left? Something like that. It could be right left right. I don't know what pattern he used on the kick, but it was definitely like duka duka ga duka 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 ga duka duka duka. That was sort of what he had going on there, and very fast. So like harder to hear. Super fast. Yeah, yeah. But I like that because I never, I don't play double bass. Probably why I never thought of doing that. But interesting that you could manipulate just that little chunk of the pattern um, and then get it get it get it that fast that was like a more metaled out version of a thing that I like to play all mm-hmm. the time and you can do it with four notes five notes if you did it I started with the five note one but like you do this with a four note pattern so like right left left kick uh, and then stutter the kick it's almost a herta and then threes, that would be right, left, left. And he's moving those around the drum set. It's a really cool pattern. I might steal that one from you, brother. <laughs> that was really cool. Sweet. Cool, but dude, fast, clean, super powerful playing for sure. You can hear all that pad work translate on the kit well, which, yep. is, which is nice to see because that's not always the case. But yeah. Um, yeah, powerful, clean playing. That's for sure. Those are two words that come to mind immediately. Powerful and clean, but yeah. awesome playing playing dude really cool one yeah all right cool well thank you so much to both of the drummers we feature on the spotlight of sleepers oh yeah today that'll do it for that it'll move us on into q a okay it's the part of the podcast where we answer questions duh these questions come from instagram youtube forums of orlandodrummer.com the inbox of my email chris at orlandodrummer.com if you have any questions for the podcast please send them directly to me first question from michael b would you rather gain 30 years of experience in hand technique or 30 years of experience in foot technique? Ooh. Thir- so you get to fast forward in time. Oh, yeah. 30 years of hand or practice? Or just gain... Well, do are my hands falling apart yet? Because No, would be- <laughs> not, well, not fast forward, but <laughs> just be in my like 60s. if you were to just, I don't know, d- d- quantify experience, sure, and you get sure. 30 years of it automatically in your hands. Hands or feet? It feels okay, and maybe I'm wrong here, but it feels like the the obvious answer would be hands, but like the wise answer would be feet. Feet, You're like yeah, it would be feet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like. I think hands would be initially the most fun, the most impressive to everyone else, but feet is like it's like that sleeper skill set. Yeah. Like oh, nobody puts thirty years into their feet like consciously. That's an because it even include left foot. Yeah. So you'd have some independence worked <laughs> out. You'd have all the Latin patterns worked out, all those ostinatos. But I still think I'm going to be a dummy and say hands. Because oh, <laughs> that sounds... Showboaty. Yeah, I would just want to show... Like 30 years? Like, oh man, how many rudiments do I know? How how mobile am I around the kit? 
Yeah, they would just be more fun. It would be more fun. But you would be so mismatched. Like if you're if you have 30 years of experience just on two limbs and not the other two, like you would just be like a sick bongo player, but like I don't do foot stuff anymore cuz I don't do foot stuff. Yeah, the the, con- the contrast is extreme, you know. My feet oh, are just man. like useless compared to my hands now. But oh, I think man. I would go hands just to be just to be oh, just be fun. Just boring. be fun. That's a good question though. I like the would you rather almost style yeah. of question. Those yeah. are, you got any of those? Send them send those our way. Those are a lot of fun. Yeah, they are fun. Oh man. Yeah, short and sweet, but that's hands. a good one. I wouldn't expect you to say <laughs> hands. You should have said feet, but <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Michael B. Next question from Andrew M asks in your playing what drum techniques have you found to be necessary to spend time on the most time consuming technique i ever had to work on was push pull push pull technique with the hands um there's a full course on it but let me not be rude i'll get grab a stick and show you so is there a stick in the studio <laughs> here we go all right so i got a drumstick so push pull is effectively two motions it's the push which is like you roll the stick somewhat inwards, like towards your, uh, it, it rolls in towards the center of your body. So it would roll this way in your right hand or this way in your left hand. Sorry for audio listeners, that doesn't make any sense. But it rolls as you extend it. So you drop your fingers down and you let the stick come to sort of towards the end of your pointer finger and your thumb. So that's the push, like that. And once you get good at the push, you'll realize that you can create some rebound there. So you push and the stick actually bounces, boink, bounces up back into like an upright position. And then the pull is literally just pulling back down with your finger. So it's it's like a two-part technique. And I've never met anyone that had any natural ability to do this. Everyone who I've ever showed this to, all of my private students from back in the day, all my friends, mm-hmm. everyone had the same reaction, which is like, what in the hell are you doing? Like, how, how does this yeah. work, right? It's not natural to anyone. Yeah. But... Once you learn push pull, it's interesting because it doesn't it, it it's not a technique that you blatantly choose to play. It almost like infiltrates all of your other hand techniques and it just becomes like kind of sort of an unconscious option. So you'll catch yourself kind of doing it all the time. But it's pretty rare that you would just choose to play something that way. There are definitely exceptions. I've seen JP Bouvet do high tempo uh, 16th note ride groove. So like, and you can see that he very intentionally goes into push pull. So push pull, push pull, push pull, push pull. He goes into that technique because he spent enough time doing it where using exclusively that technique gives him a certain sound, an ability to play at a certain speed. So you can use it intentionally, but for me, it's always like, it's unconscious. Like once I learned how to do it, it just kind of shows up in different parts of my playing really without me ever choosing to use it again. But that's, what was the question like, what's the hardest or the most valuable? Well, what drum techniques have you found to be necessary to spend your time on? Nece- Assuming that there are some that are unnecessary or there are. lower priority. Traditional grip would be one. That's an elective. You don't have to do that at all, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, you, you, you really, class. well, I suck at it. I never practiced it at all. You, you don't have have to do it so there's some that go in that category of what like are other unnecessary techniques or... unnecessary yeah um i think molar ends up being something that people do naturally yeah like if you, i did molar a lot if you yeah. never heard that word the phrase that... or never understood the concept of a wave you can play long enough and your body will just do that yeah right it's almost like i don't know like there are definitely like techniques for running and jogging but mm-hmm. If you never knew what those were and you never practiced them, you'll get pretty close if you just run and jog a lot, right? Yeah. Like there, it's kind of like that. Some stuff you will figure out naturally by putting in the time, um, though it, that's a little dangerous because you can develop really bad habits and then a teacher's mm-hmm. gotta fix that for you. But I think I would say that the highest like ROI on technique that you're gonna get, return on investment would <laughs> would probably be push pull. At least for me, that, that's been the case. Like having put in a ton of time into that and being very intentional, like I cannot play this at all. Let me sit down with a pad and just push, pull, push, pull. Like weeks and weeks and weeks of that until I could even play a sloppy double stroke roll, right? Um, that ended up paying off huge dividends for me in the long run. So for me, the highest, 
effort and the highest reward technique is definitely worth your time is push pull for sure. I think that's, I don't know how I can give any other answer. For me, that was no, like, I mean, it was the a, hardest and the most answer. effective. Yeah, yeah. it's completely necessary. We help, you know, push those boundaries. So mm-hmm. cool. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew, for the question. Thank you for your questions. If you have any questions, please uh, comment down below on the YouTube comment section uh, via Instagram on the Instatops page, the members area of OrlandoDrummer.com, or shoot me an email at Chris at OrlandoDrummer.com. That'll do it for Q&A. And I'll leave it to you to close out the podcast. Sure. So I got a got a nice easy closing message for you. Um, for the last, God, it's got to be five or six years. Uh, I've been in a drum group chat on Instagram. Ah. Um, it's uh, it's called Drumminati. The Drumminati. Drumminati. I've and heard we- <laughs> of such a such a group chat. Before. Yeah, yeah. It's just a group chat with a bunch of um, mostly like YouTube drummers, content creators, people yeah. like that. Go ahead, name drop. Name and, drop. Uh, who's on the? Oh, I'm not name drop. I'm not name- <laughs> talking about the members of Drumminati. Go ahead. I'm not even technically in Drumminati. I don't know, really know what, oh, what we're even talking about here. An illegitimate uh, member of Drumminati. <laughs> but you know, it, it's a it's a drum group chat, let's just mm-hmm. say, and I've got a, several of those, but, you know, it's funny, because I realize, I, you know, I, rather, I forget sometimes how valuable having any group chat like that is, even if it's not other pro drummers, just you and some friends, or just a buddy, just having a drum buddy in general, and I'm fortunate to have a lot of those mm-hmm. from being in the drum industry so long, I've just met a, a, a lot of awesome drummers that I'm really, really happy and proud to call my friends, but... I I definitely remember being 18, 19, 20 years old and not knowing anyone that I could talk about drums with, and not just for fun, but also to help me solve problems. Like having someone who was learning about videography and audio recording and playing drums all at the same time. Like I didn't have those people when I was really young, early on in my career. And now I realize sometimes how fortunate I am to run into a weird software problem in Logic or I have a question in Final Cut about how to edit a certain thing, or I'm trying to learn a specific drum part and I don't know how to do it, I get confused or I get stuck. You know, to have this this like team of people who I know I can reach out to and ask for support or advice or to help me solve a problem, that's super, super valuable. So if you're listening to this and you're uh, a young drummer or you're just someone who's never been that plugged into the drum industry where you started meeting people like this, you know, a, a really good goal would be to, Find some sort of micro community of people who are doing the same thing that you're doing. And it's not a selfish thing to say that I want a community of people like that so they can help me because it's a matter of time before they're going to need your help too. Uh, but for me, it, it's it's become more and more obvious like how how lucky I am to have that big group of people to ask for support, to ask for help, um, to, to get problems solved, things like that. And again, could be a software thing, could be a playing thing, could be a drum video you saw 10 years ago and you're like, who's that guy that played that thing? When you ask 10 drummers, like one of them's gonna be like, oh dude, that was Derek Roddy from 1997. Like, like that stuff happens all the time, you know? Um, so it's, anyway, that would be my, my challenge for the week for anybody watching. If you don't have a, a even a small circle of drum friends, you know, try and make that that drum group chat, whatever that is. It's really a, a super helpful resource because if I run into a dead end on Google and I can't figure out how to solve a certain problem in my studio or you know for content that I'm making, whatever it is, uh, my next stop is is Drumminati. It's that group chat and uh, the knowledge, the, the combined knowledge and wisdom of all of the people in that chat, dude, it is so nice to have access to all of those people in one place. Um, so yeah, cool thing you can do this week, man. Start yourself a, a drum chat. It's uh, of a greater benefit than you might think. Yeah. So yeah. All right. That's it. That's all we got. Episode 25. It was a good one. Thank Love you, Chris. Me. Cool. That'll be our quarter life crisis handled very well. Oh, yeah. Well, we're so we're ending at 100, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. Well, it's been fun. It's been fun. A good right. one, man. Thank cool. you, brother. We will catch you guys next week. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Peace.